guys good? Okay. Good evening. I would like to call the session this Monday, November 28, 2022, regular session of the Carmel Clay School Board to order. Roll call, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Madam President. Everyone except for Mr. Uh, Mike Koshner, who is not feeling well this evening, is present and accounted. Thank you. Will you please rise and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have some exciting presentations to start our evening with. Um, when all of the presentations are completed, we will take a short pause. Um, as we do know, it's a school night, so we know that um, there's homework and bedtime. So we'd like to first get started with our Young Artist Awards with Dr. Amy Dudley. Well, good evening. This evening, it is my great pleasure to honor our young artists, and you can see their wonderful work here in our boardroom, which will be displayed for the next six months. Um, we're so proud of these young artists. But before I call our young artists up to um, shake hands with Dr. B and to come up in front of the board, I first would like to um, acknowledge all of our fabulous art teachers, and I know many of them are here. If you could, if you could stand and be recognized, our art teachers. And it's the fine work of our art teachers that work with our students each and every day to um, really help our students to learn these skills and that appreciation for art. I also have a special shout out to Mr. Phil Lamy. Mr. Lamy. <laughs> Mr. Lamy is our wonderful art teacher from Tom Meadow. My own, my own children had Mr. Lamy years and years ago. Um, and he is retiring this December. So we will miss you very much, Mr. Lamy, and thank you for all of your working with our students. Okay, so our young artists. First, we have Ellie Fossum, a kindergarten student from Carmel Elementary. Come on up, Ellie. Next, we have Hayden Tutton, a senior from Carmel High School. We have N.I. Brown, a sixth grade student from Carmel Middle School. We have Corollis Hanna, a fifth grade student from Cherry Tree. Next, we have Jackson Markland, a fourth grade student from Clay Center. Next, we have Madison Bowser, a seventh grade student from Clay Middle School. Next, we have Nitya Parsmuth Marthy, a fifth grade student from Collegewood. Next on our list is Haley Long, a seventh grade student from Creekside Middle School. Next, we have John Lopes, a first grade student from Forestdale.
Next, we have Rennie Coffin, a second grade student from Mohawk Trails. Isaac Ming, a kindergarten student from Prairie Trace. Next, we have Cecilia Maroney, a fifth grade student from Smoky Row. Next, we have Madeline Smith, a fifth grade student from Town Meadow. <laughs> Caleb Wee, a third grade student from West Clay. And Annabelle Crosby, a fourth grade student from Woodbrook. Congratulations to all of our young artists. And parents, you'll have a chance to take pictures here. And then when we take a break, if you'd like to get a picture with their artwork, you um, may certainly do that as well. Thank you so much to our young artists. I can tell you when we will enjoy these for months to come. We will now move on to Mr. Jim Inskeep for the Carmel High School Girls Golf Team State Champions. Thank you, Mrs. Browning and Dr. Beresford. Uh, obviously a, a great honor for our teams to be here this evening and uh, we appreciate you honoring their great uh, achievements here this fall. And uh, before I'd start, I'd like to uh, just say thank you to Mr. Kirshner and Mrs. Spannenberg for their, their great support of our Greyhound athletic teams over their years on the board. So uh, you'll be greatly missed, and our kids really appreciate all the support you've given them here over the years. And um, certainly you're, you're welcome to come freeze on, uh, on game night if you'd like, and uh, maybe a November game or something. <laughs> The uh, first group we've got this evening is our girls golf team. I'd like to invite members of that team and their coaches to come forward here along with the table. While they are coming up, I will say just a few words about the team. They completed an amazing season by winning the state championship on October 1st at Prairie View Golf Course in Carmel. It was the third title for the program and their first since 2013. Um, the best way I could describe this group is, is happy and relaxed. Um, I think we can all agree that golf is a huge mental component to the game, and these student athletes have managed that skill throughout the season, and uh, they are a lot of fun to be around, and they, they handle some really pressure-packed situations with, with the great grace. So, Claire Swathwood, uh, Sophie Mock, and Michaela Headley earned all state honors at the state finals. The head coach is Kelly Klusner, and she is assisted by Scott Bowen and Dan Patane. 
I'm now going to have each member of the team come up and introduce themselves. If they are a senior, please tell us what your future plans are, and then uh, come in front from the board, and we'll take a picture just like the young artist did. Hi, my name is Michaela, and I'm a junior. Hi, I'm Cameron Williams, and I'm a junior. Hi, I'm Sophie Mock, and I'm a sophomore. I'm Claire Swathwood, and I'm a junior. I'm Maya Berglund, and I'm a senior, and I'm planning to play golf somewhere in Florida, but I'm still undecided quite yet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ava Wynn. I'm a senior, and I'm not planning on playing golf, but I'm thinking I'm going to major in pharmacy. Hi, I'm Sophie Cassidy. I'm a senior, and I'm planning to go to culinary school at uh, Rhode Island at, Pro at Johnson & Wales University. Congratulations. We will now be excited to recognize our Carmel High School Boys Cross Country State Champions. Thank you again. I'm going to have members of our Boys Cross Country team come forward. While they're walking up, I'll say a little bit about their season. Um, the Boys Cross Country team won the state championship on October 29th at the famed Laverne Gibson course in Terre Haute. That's an inside joke for those that read the AltaVote emails. It is the 17th overall title for the program and the first since 2018. The team had a dominant year, and we are very, very proud of the way that they represent the school and community anywhere they go. So especially when you see them out on the Monon Trail running, along all of the uh, trails and sidewalks up and down Main Street um, year-round, um, they just do a great job. Senior Cole Matisson became the second Greyhound ever to win the Boys Individual State Championship. <laughs> the head coach is Colin Altavo. He is assisted by Josh Puccinelli, Nate Gafkin, and Jason Rigsby. Now each member of the team will come up and introduce themselves. If you're a senior, please tell us what your future plans are. I'm Jack Capes. I'm a sophomore. I'm Thomas, I'm Thomas Biltemeyer, and I'm a junior. I'm Cole Matisson. I'm a senior, and I plan on running cross-country and track and field at the University of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, I'm Charlie Ledke. Um, I plan on running in college, but I'm undecided right now.
I'm Connor Mallon. I'm a senior, and I'm planning to run in college, but I'm currently undecided. I'm KJ Sweeney. I'm a senior, and I plan to run at the United States Naval Academy. I'm Tony Provenzano. I'm a junior. Our final presentation for tonight is the Carmel Education Foundation Fall Grant winners, Mrs. Jennifer Penix. Hi, good, good evening. I am, excuse me, I'll go here. Um, I am Jennifer Penix. I am the Executive Director of the Carmel Education Foundation, and it is my honor and privilege to be here tonight to tell you a little bit about the 50-plus teachers in our district that received a grant from the foundation this past semester. Just a kind of a couple of quick things about the foundation. Our mission is to support Carmel Clay students in academic achievement and lifelong learning. And the grants that we select to, um, to receive funding do represent this. We have four guiding principles. Education is power. Everybody benefits. We, work for, we go further together. And we are here to honor the work. And again, our grants really go back to that. We have four focus areas for our grants this semester. Or the, yeah, for this semester. They are on STEM education, innovative instruction, wellness, and workforce readiness. We, oh, we also had, there's three different categories. Uh, teachers could get an individual grant, a team grant, or a collaboration grant. A collaboration grant might be across schools or across departments within a school. Um, this is kind of exciting news for us. We awarded $21,000 in grants this semester, and that took us over our million-dollar mark in the amount of uh, awards that we have given to teachers. So we're pretty excited about that. That's a big number for us. Um, and I do want to say thank you. We have some great community support. Uh, Fanning Howie, Kroger Gardison Regis, and Summers Plumbing, Heating, and Cooling have all helped to sponsor either the grants or a grant recep uh, reception. We had all of our grant recipients, they had a reception here earlier this um, month, and so we got to recognize them individually. I'm going to share just a little bit about each of these grants, and I will talk quickly so I can get us all uh, home uh, soon. But I want to first start with... Um, Actually, before I even get into this, I do want to say thank you to the school board for your support and everything that you do for the foundation, and particularly to Mrs. Spannenberg and Mr. Kirshner, who have been unbelievable supporters of the foundation and showing up at our activities and, and supporting us and supporting our teachers to really make this all happen for us. So thank you very much to you. Um, our first grant that we awarded uh, was Lila J, along with Brooke Adams, Elizabeth Elliott, Tammy Dillon, Angie Powell, Karina Mercer, and Lauren Kramer. They're bringing a portable story walk to the Smoky Row campus. Um, aside from getting students outside for learning, there's collaboration against, uh, across different grade levels and disciplines. 
support of multilingual learners as stories can be scanned to be read aloud in multiple languages. Um, there's even a tie-in with buddy classrooms and special teachers that can integrate stories into their lessons. Even more importantly, Smoky Row is uh, the perfect setting for this with the wetlands and walking paths. And this is not only for Smoky Row families, but for the community to use as well. Uh, next, Shannon McClintock will introduce SNAP circuits to help third grade students at Forestdale understand the basics of electrical circuits and electrical energy. With this understanding, students will create a variety of projects to solve a multitude of problems, uh, which is an integral part of hands-on STEM learning. Stephanie Croning from Clay Center Elementary is investing in Playaways, which are preloaded audiobooks that give kids portability and freedom. Uh, this grant will be used to develop a high interest audiobook selection in the Media Center for all students in grades three to five. Tom Giro from Collegewood is excited to incorporate pickleball into the curriculum rotation for second through fifth grade students. He is on the bandwagon. Um, the focus will be on the fundamentals of swinging, volleying, serving, and playing. Um, pickleball can also be easily adapted to allow all students to participate and enjoy this activity. And furthermore, as you may know, there are numerous parks now in Carmel that offer free pickleball ball courts, and he will make sure to highlight those. Sarah Harding from Prairie Trace will integrate Project Lead the Way units into reading and science curriculum, allowing students to work on oral comprehension and collaboration with peers. Decodable readers uh, enable students to listen to and read, to books that, read books that are at their level, increasing confidence and building knowledge. Kristen Pyron is eager to supply contemporary board games to middle school students um, at Creekside Middle School. These games will provide students with an opportunity to play and learn at the same time. In addition to improving their math skills, they'll increase their communication and problem solving skills. This next grant will allow Allie Powell from Carmel Elementary to work with multi-language learners, many of whom are new to the US. They will engage in curriculum to develop reading skills, such as identifying letters and sounds through games, story creators, and reading manipulatives. Carmen Smith is bringing Mark Wood, the founder of the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, to Carmel Middle School to work with students for three days of instruction and a performance on the fourth day. Music has been arranged specifically for the ability level of the uh, CAM students, which comes along with performance tracks made by professional musicians. It's pretty cool. Uh, along the lines of music, I'm um, kind of taking it a different direction. Julia Walker, who is Clay Center's music teacher, will include multifunctional Remo rhythm lid drum heads into her lesson. These are designed to fit on a five gallon bucket to be used as a hand drum. Group drumming facilitates feelings of belonging, acceptance, safety, and care, and creates opportunity for new social interactions. Um, in fact, according to a study performed in, uh, by the Royal College of Music, drumming activities are shown to reduce depression by 38% and anxiety by 20%. They also are deemed to be, uh, increase social resilience and improve overall well-being for both adults and students. So I think we should have a drumming circle um, at some point, so that would be a nice thing. Um, and next is uh, Anna Woods. Uh, the, a student-led snack cart will be spearheaded by Anna at Prairie Trace. This cart will help students work on or develop their social pragmatic communication skills following directions, comprehension, math and reading skills, teamwork, and adaptive skills such as keeping a tidy workspace, cleanliness, body awareness, etc. Each students or each week students will come together and carry out jobs they are assigned to based on the student's goal area, which may include cart pusher, hole puncher, money holder, order reader, or food deliverer. Uh, in order to create lifelong physical learners, we need to expose students to activities that can be fostered at all ages and stages of life. Hence, three middle school teachers, Hillary McCamer from Clay, Bree Miller from Carmel, and Jenny Berjou from Creekside, are collaborating with Cabela's Outdoor Fund to work with an expert to tailor outdoor fitness programs to the unique uh, surroundings and infrastructure at each of their school campuses. Um, activities may include things such as fishing, hiking, aquatics, um, and teachers and other experts in the field have observed and witnessed that the lack of connection to nature is affecting our mental health. So this program provides overall well-being while offering a way to connect STEM as a cross-curricular opportunity. Jenny Tucker and Anastasia Volk-Maroney 
are uh, lighting the way for students in their art classrooms at Creekside. Individual light boxes allow students to express creative thought and craftsmanship by appropriating popular images into their work. Um, additionally, conversations and lessons on proprietary creative products and copyright issues open up a lot of new opportunities for conversation about art in the digital age. Um, and also, this is a, an opportunity for many students uh, to find a pathway to success in art that might otherwise be unavailable. Prairie Trace teachers Rachel Green, Mackenzie Clark, Lyle Lugman, Lindsay Porter, and Claire Back will provide decodable text for students to take home to practice their phonics skills. Decodable texts encourage orthographic mapping, which builds a strong foundation for reading and development. Books will go between home and school to allow for more communication and interaction with parents. Okay, grab your umbrella and take note of what James Hambly, Susan Fulp, Sean McVeigh, and Laura Wood are doing with the weather stations around the Clay Middle School campus. Uh, student scientists will use sling hygrometers to measure humidity, anim anemometers or something of like that. Um, I need to go to this lesson. And wind socks to measure wind speed and direction, Barometers to measure atmospheric pressure, thermometers to measure temperature, I do know that one, uh, and rain gauges to measure precipitation. They will then analyze measurements, create a weather map of the campus, look for patterns, and graph the changes in weather over time for specific weather stations. Carmel High School teachers Adam Havis, Ryan Osborne, and Josh Cole will help students make potentially life-saving connections between drug use and abuse, risky behavior, or decision-making impossible consequences. Fatal vision goggles allow students the ability to see how being impaired can impact their ability to drive and do other daily tasks. Students will first evaluate all the positive aspects of their life and hypothesize how alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs may create possibilities for risky situations, poor decision-making, and addiction. Uh, Prairie Trace students love to read, and teachers Tracy Henry, Taylor Bruni, Sam Gall, Lauren Tobin, and Rhonda Cruz are investing the bo in books that will motivate learners to be even more engaged during STEM. Books will cover four domains, and uh, they have a variety of uh, titles and interests, including volcanoes, amphibians, creatures of land and water, how magnets work, reuse and recycle, the great horned owl rescue, and landforms around the world. On the other side of town, West Clay students will dig into math. Uh, teachers Doug McCreary, Heather Banks, Emily White, Tyson Smith, Lauren Walton, and Christina Roosh will use math toolkits for hands-on learning, making math more meaningful. Toolkits are organized and full of resources that promote creative problem solving in the math classroom. Materials include such things as the 21st century pattern blocks, 24 game cards, fraction pattern blocks, and other resources um, combined with existing math manipulatives. The intervention curriculum, this intervention curriculum led by Tara Staub, Sarah Morris, and Betsy Rose at Cherry Tree will allow for implementation of more effective lessons for students needing intense intervention. These interventions not only align with the science of reading, but align with their school-wide phonics program. It will significantly impact the reading instruction that these students receive both in and out of their classrooms. Uh, each week, 12 students at Mohawk Trails come together for multi-sensory hands-on activities so, uh, social skills group. The students refer to it as a cooking group. However, it is so much more. Led by Jennifer Deuce, Elizabeth Sylvie, and Rachel Taylor, this project provides direct, explicit instruction in an innovative, multi-sensory and hands-on way. Students will participate in a weekly cooking group, taking turns uh, choosing an activity to teach to their peers. They'll stand in front of the group, provide step-by-step -step directions, um, and which will gain, help them gain self-confidence and practice their speaking and listening skills. So here are our grant winners, so let's give them a round of applause. And thank you. Um, again, it is our honor to be able to recognize these uh, outstanding accomplishments or uh, ideas that the, our teachers have. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Carmel Education Foundation for sponsoring such grants. Thank you for our educators for thinking outside the box and applying for these. And thank you so much to our community for supporting these in many different ways. And the Ghost and Goblins Run and many others, you are supporting some of these great things happening in Carmel Clay School. So thank you so much. We will now take a three to five minute pause of our meeting, take pictures, um, 
if you want to see your children's artwork, go home, do your homework, go to bed, listen to your parents. Have a good night. <laughs>
Thank you so much for those of you who decide to stay. We will now continue on with our um, public comment. We do have one public comment tonight. Um, I do want to bring your attention to a couple of the items here. Is participants must be recognized by the presiding officer and must preface their comments by announcement of their name and a group affiliation if applicable. Comments may not reference specific corporation employees, patrons, or students. They shall be directed to the board and no person may address or question individual board members. And finally, as a general matter, the school board will not act on or respond to questions or comments made during public comment, but will take them under advisement. I would now like to invite our speaker up to the podium, um, Jim May. Thank you. I'm Jim May. I'm a parent of two kids at Woodbrook. I'm a rookie, so I'm going to read tonight. I have a timer. Okay. Um, so over the past several months, our community has been subjected to a local manifestation of a national movement attacking our public schools and attacking their administrators, their teachers, their staff, and honestly, by extension, many of the students in the schools and their families. Um, this past election season across the country um, in white majority suburbs, we saw slates of school board candidates running on nearly identical platforms of academic excellence, parents' rights, and increased transparency. And I can't speak to how ethical or unethical these cookie cutter campaigns were run across the rest of the country, but as a Carmel resident who was paying attention, I'm comfortable saying that the campaign we saw here was built extensively on misinformation, um, dishonesty, and at times outright lies about our schools. Um, the campaign failed in so much as the candidates did not get a majority on the school board, um, which is what they were pursuing. But despite that, um, we still have to pay a cost for their actions. And I'm here tonight to ask, as a parent, um, for some things I'd like to see the school system do to help address that cost and, and relay it to the community. Um, I would like to see a survey or some other means used to give a voice to our teachers and staff while protecting their anonymity. Um, I would like to hear from them about how it feels to have members of the community do things like call them groomers, um, insinuate that they're pedophiles, say that they're exposing kids to pornography, claim that they're making children ashamed of their skin color, and state that they're brainwashing our children with political indoctrination, which were all claims that were made this last political season. Um, I would like some insight into how our teachers' morale has been impacted by having these, for lack of a better word, paranoid delusions treated by many, many members of the community as credible. I would also like to see an attempt going forward to document how these types of attacks impact our school's ability both to retain and to attract top-tier teachers and staff to our schools. Um, it seems likely that we'll see these types of tactics used again um, down the road, and I think that our community should understand what they cost us when we see them. I'd also like to close just by saying thank you to the board, the administration, and most of all, um, teachers and students who work day in and day out with our kids. Um, I know that the vast majority of our parents recognize the work we do and truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We will now move on to the consent items, approval of consent, which includes personnel report, claims, payroll, approval of gift applications, we have a $250 general donation to Smoky Row Elementary School from Blackboard Giving Fund on behalf of the Crow Foundation. An anonymous, an anonymous donor gave $4,500 to Town Meadow Elementary to fund an author visit by Stacy McNulty. And Martin Marietta made a general donation of $500 to Carmel High School. We also have minutes from the workshop session of October 10th. Um, from the executive session October 24th, the regular session on the 24th, and a special session on the 28th. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving consent, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. We will now move on to our first action item, permission to advertise for a public hearing on additional appropriations. Mr. McMichael. Thank you. Um, um, our 2022 budget was approved about a year and a half ago, and, and since that time, a number of things have happened. Specifically, in our uh, referendum fund, we're in need of additional appropriation, 
of, of, of a million four hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's primarily due to um, something very positive and that is that we um, the police department the Carmel police department was successful in getting our SROs into our schools earlier than we originally anticipated and then secondly um, some of the billing was uh, delayed to us um, from 2021 so we're we're having to pay a little bit of, uh, of uh, 21 22, 20, 2021 expenses as well as the 22. However, none of this has uh, requires any more money than we already have. We have the cash. We we just the appropriation just gives us the authority to spend it. Is this helpful? Yes. Thank you. So I have a motion to recommend the board authorize administration to advertise a public hearing for December 12th, 2022, regarding an additional appropriation of one million four hundred fifty thousand thousand dollars for the safety referendum fund so moved do i have a second second any discussion all those in favor of recommending the authorization for the public hearing please signify by saying aye aye, aye. motion carries four to zero we will now move on to 5.2 a bid award for the carmel high school greyhound activity center mr mcmichael May I have a motion to recommend that we award the bid for the Carmel High School Greyhound Activity Center? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor of approving, please signify by oh, discussion. Thanks. Roger, have we used Frederick's Incorporated before? I don't recognize that name. You know, I'm not 100% sure, but we tried clicking on it yet. Okay. The name sounded familiar to me. The name sounded familiar, familiar to me, but uh, I couldn't. Uh, recall specifically what project they were in. okay thank you any other questions from the board okay all those in favor of approving the bid award please signify by saying aye aye aye, aye. motion carries four to zero we now have a bid award for the carmel high school synthetic turf replacement mr mcmichael thank you this is uh, a bid award for actually four fields two practice fields and then the uh, uh, the stadium competition field as well as the uh, murray stadium field they were all um, installed in 2014, I believe. Um, you'll note that we solicited bids from um, um, eight, eight bidders, um, and we had five that picked up the documents, but unfortunately we only had one, one bidder that responded. Um, in the past couple of years, and this has been, you know, fairly common, honestly. Uh, we, I remember we had a boiler bid that was a million dollars, and that was the first one that we had one bid on, which I had not seen that for years. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, a project that size that there seemingly was no interest. I'm not sure why we, we only had one bid, um, but I do know that um, many times contractors are having trouble. They have enough work that, and they can't hire enough labor to they can only do so much work. And in fact, um, the two practice fields, we bid them now in order to get the product um, after the activity center is up and at least finished on the outside so, because it's right adjacent to it. So there, uh, we had to get on it more or less a list to get get product as much as a year from now. Uh, so um, it's just difficult out there in the construction business these days. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I would also note that uh, this project's about 21 percent less than the estimate. So uh, we always get worried if we don't have competition to know what and you know, what the right price is. But uh, we feel pretty comfortable with in this case. Do I have a motion to approve the bid award for the synthetic turf? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? I just wanted to say thank you for including that information with regards to the price for the synthetic turf. I was fairly concerned and I wasn't sure if this base price, um, if this bid 
was competitive, if you felt like it fit in. Um, the type of turf, are we going to have a similar greyhound, or are they going to have a, does this include fun design? Yes. All of that could <laughs> I don't know the specifics, right. but I know there's been quite a bit of conversation about, uh, and certainly we will get complete insight with uh, what the high school staff would recommend with, as far as the, the marking, and we've always done that uh, okay. in the fields. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One other question. What is the life cycle? Is it about seven years? Or no, it's life? about, um, it's a, it has been about 10. Um, uh, we, we, um, I'm trying to think, we, the, uh, the, the varsity football field, this will be the third time it's been replaced. So uh, it, it had, it's, in the past it's been about nine, 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, but now newer products they're saying is more, pushing more like 11, 12 years. So like a, a lot of things, they're, they're kind of getting better at it, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do, there's a safety test that has to be done. So because of, eventually it, it, uh, it needs to be replaced, not because it's worn out so much. It's, it is worn out in the sense of, mm -hmm. of uh, the shock um, values in it. So um, we, of course, always test it to be sure that it's um, in good shape before we would use it. I don't, sorry, I don't know this. So I was gonna, <laughs> just going to, are all of our, uh, Football and soccer fields, turf. There's, no, n no. Um, the, at the high school, I'm trying to think. At the high school, um, they they have all been turfed except one practice field, and that field now is where we're building the activity center. Uh, when we first put in turf, uh, it wasn't as as common as it is now, and so at that at the time we did the practice fields, the coach wanted one grass field just because so if the kids when they played if they played on grass you know away on an away game they would at least had some experience on it but that's mm -hmm. changing rapidly mm -hmm. okay. thank you and i also would like just to make note that this was um reviewed by skillman corporation too to make sure yeah. that it fit in with you know appropriate um skill set and responsible bid and i also appreciate you mentioning that you know not only is you know, there's an aesthetic aspect to our fields looking nice, but we also, <coughs> more importantly, care about this, our student safety and the athletes that are playing on there. So I think that's an important distinction, too. Yes. Thank you. Um, do I have um, any other questions? Um, all those in favor of approving the bid award for the Carmel High School synthetic turf replacement, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries four to zero. We now have three change orders. Um, do we have a motion to take those all at once? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, Mr. McMichael, if you would like to explain 5.4, 5.5, and 5.6. Okay, let's see. We'll start with um, that was on 5.6. So, um, 5.5 is uh, uh, related to um, Hartman. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm still short one. 5.4. Uh, is related to the Performing Arts Center, um, and it's in the amount of $168,694. However, that that uh, amount is entirely back charged to an, another contractor. Uh, we had to use um, this contractor uh, because the, the original contractor was not performing uh, timely, and so we, but they'll, they'll their contract will be deducted by this amount. Our next one is is Hartman uh, baseball field, and um, there's one back or uh, back charge in this um, bid. In, that's a that the total amount of the change orders is eight thousand three hundred fifty three dollars, um, but the net amount is just over six thousand dollars because there's one back charge in here that's not recognized in the tabulation. Then we go to uh, five point six, which has to do with uh, bike rack installation. And it's actually a, it's a deduct change order of eleven thousand five hundred and sixty-two, and I think that's it. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to approve change orders five point four to five point six? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. Well, Roger, thank you for your fiscal responsibility, thank and you. I would like to point out the the savings that you have been able to find, as well as, I guess reassessing who is responsible for what and getting money back from those contractors who are not able to perform. Um, I just appreciate all you do. Thank you. Well, it's not me so much as our, we have a team that works on all this Thank stuff. you, team, that's <laughs> out there as well. Todd Fanolio, for example, is one of our members. 
Any other board questions? Um, I also would just like to note um, the district-wide bike racks. I think that um, that is much appreciated um, with so many um, children walk, walk riding their bike to have a safe place to put them. So I do appreciate that too. All right. All the any other questions? All those in favor of approving 5.4 to 5.6, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Four to zero. We will now move on to our Carmel Clay Board of School Trustee norms. Um, this was something that we discussed at our last meeting. Um, this is something that will supplement our um, board bylaws. I do want to make note that since our last meeting, I have added a paragraph um, and shared that with you, and I'd like to talk about that in our meeting today. Um, it's on confidentiality, the, and then the paragraph reads as follows. The Carbon Clay School Board members understand that in the course of performing board duties, they will have access to privileged and sensitive confidential information not otherwise available to the public at large about employees, students, their families, or school business. The board agrees to utilize personal information obtained only in the performance of board responsibilities. Confidential information will be held in the truest confidence as required per law. That also comes from policy 8350 and bylaw 0144. Two. Any questions or discussion? On that? Well, let me first I'll do a motion and then I'll ask. Do I have a motion to approve the Carmel Clay Board governance norms? So moved. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Discussion. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. Do we think it would be valuable to put references to the policies for that? They're there. Oh, you do? Okay. I didn't see your thing. Okay. That's all. Yeah, I tried to go through and add whenever applicable um, any if there was ever any um, board like bylaws mm -hmm. to make sure that they were cross reference. Okay. Um, this document, once approved, will be available on the website under the board page for anyone to view if they want. Okay, and then do we keep a cross reference somewhere so that we know if uh, a bylaw is retired or if it's updated or the number has changed where all it's referenced mm -hmm. yes so this is something so this is a similar document to our um, communication expectations mm -hmm. where it's something as a board we need to review annually um, in order to kind of check those different things so it is unlike our bylaws our policies this mm -hmm. is kind of would be its own separate thing that we would just as a board need to make sure that we annually review and approve things like that similar to how we do with our communication expectations so that would make sense that we would just include this then when we do our communication expectations as well as our guiding principles. Guiding principles. Okay. Yeah, usually we do that our annual retreat or advance. <sighs> yeah, I just wanted to make sure if the number was changed or updated in the other document, we had somewhere where it's cross-referenced. Yeah. yeah, so that's just something that, you know, I'll just be watching for and as we um, annually review this, okay, we'll just have to update. Mm -hmm. Okay, second, kind of a grammar. Yeah. Bylaws, B Y L A W. Probably. Yeah. Okay, you might want to update that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or thoughts? My thoughts is I really like it. Mm -hmm. And I think you did a really nice job consolidating several different policies and bylaws, which is really board behavior and, and responsibilities in one document that is easy to access. Um, and then there's also the references, so you can go back and read more, you know, figure out the details. I'd have to say I was on the board probably a full year before I read through all the policies and bylaws, and um, and then two years later I decided we needed to do something better than what we had. So I'm glad to see that we've now added and made them even better yet. So thank you. No, you're very welcome. Um, I think this will be a great tool. Um, for the board, I think for our community to kind of learn a little bit more about what the you know the, what the board does and why do they do it. I also will share with you. Um, I did give this to the Indiana School Board Association to review, mm -hmm. and they came back um, very favorably. Um, they thought this was something great, and even so much as they looked to forward to sharing it with other school districts. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? All right, um, I will now take a motion to approve the board governance norms. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. We will now move on to the 2023, which is crazy, board meeting dates um, for the Carmel Clay School Board um, meetings. Um, these dates are decided now. Um, they will be published on our website 
um, for the upcoming year. If there's any changes along the way, we will make sure that the public is notified of those. The only change that has occurred since our last meeting is our January 23rd regular session meeting has been changed to Monday, January 30th. Do I have a motion to approve um, the 2023 school board meeting date? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? Um, I will also just make note that we tried to um, review um, these dates to make sure they didn't conflict with any um, holidays. We tried to look at as many different calendars and things as we can. So as far as we're aware of that, these should be able to um, be effective. Um, Dr. B, did you have anything or you want to say anything about this? Okay. No, um, I appreciate your hard work on that. And uh, I think we're, we're good to go. All right. Well, we got lots of opportunities for 2023. <laughs> All right, um, we will now take a vote. All those who approve the 2023 um, Carmel Clay School Board meeting dates, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries four to zero. We will now move on to the 2023 legislative letter. Um, Ms. Spannenberg and Dr. Beresford. Thank you, Katie. Madam President, thank you. Um, you all have before you the official letter. A um, couple things I wanted to share is that Dr. Beresford is working with the, the other superintendents in, um, I don't know if it's Region 5 or if it's across the state that... Um, it's really across, it's across the whole state and in uh, all the different settings, uh, big schools, little schools, rural schools, suburban schools, urban schools. Okay, so I'm excited to share that what we have been doing is now really kind of a statewide best practice in addressing some of the common areas that we feel like we can best help our legislators understand the impact of legislation and how we can best support them in making and understanding policies and laws that would best support our students and the teaching profession in general. What we have before you, and it is very similar to what you had seen last at the last meeting, is our legislative letter for 2023. And our four big topics, workforce development, or workforce or regulatory relief, special education and access to treatment for our students, and then student safety. This letter was vetted by General Counsel and um, KGR, and um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Beresford to give us a little more specifics because he did work on some of that language um, in each of those topics. Yeah, I'm happy to report that um, um, legislative sessions getting ready to to to, to gear up and. Uh, as we've done in the past, um, um, we, we're not, we don't write letters of demands and, uh, and that sort of thing, but we really want to act as a resource to our legislators so that they understand the full scope of what decisions making they make in, in, in policy and the impact it will have boots on the ground in the actual school districts. And uh, that can vary from district to district, so there's a lot of communication that goes on between different districts and different settings. Um, we want to be a credible, um, you know, resource for them so that we can avoid, number one, unintended consequences. So even best, the best uh, intention policy sometimes can ha have unintended consequences at the at what I would call the school level uh, in regards to funding. You know, a mandate that's not funded uh, can be a great mandate, but if districts don't have the, the financial capabilities to do that, it makes it really difficult. Uh, some of the pieces that are in here... Uh, and probably our biggest emphasis, and we started this emphasis two years ago, was uh, the teacher shortage. And uh, and as you've heard Dr. Ostrike report, the uh, the teacher shortage is real. And uh, we do not have the number of young people going into education that to fulfill the need uh, that that we have right now. Uh, even right today, uh, there's o there's open positions all across Indiana that are not filled. Uh, because there aren't teachers to take those positions. And so uh, we're really going to want to stress to our, our, our um, legislators that 
every bit of policy making should be looked through the lens of how is it going to impact, as far as education policy, how is that going to impact the teacher shortage? Because uh, much like our public comment speaker said tonight, um, we need to restore the profession of, of teachers and educators and instructional assistants to that, that level of nobility, that it's, 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 a, it's a mission, it's a calling, it's not just a job, and, uh, and that uh, it should be a respected uh, profession, and, uh, and it should be a well-compensated uh, profession. And, uh, and we need to, to treat it like any other uh, initiative that the state has done when, uh, when we need the, our best and brightest to be in the classroom serving our kids and our families. So uh, really excited about that piece of it and working with legislators to really, let's, let's, let's do a, you know, a, a re-envision a re you know, how we look at, at education and, uh, and let's put all of our pieces together that we're really gonna promote the, the profession because uh, uh, if not, it's, 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 it's going to be one of those uh, repercussions that will go on and affect years and years and years, and, and kids are only in school K-12, and so you know, action has to be taken immediately. So, uh, so that's a big push of, of what we're trying to accomplish is that uh, really let's change the narrative and let's, let's make it so that when we talk about policy making and funding at the state level, that we really look through it at the lens of we have to take care of our children. And I think, uh, I think this letter does a nice job of, of um, describing what the situation is and then also giving some real things that can be done uh, to, you know, to try to, to make that happen. Uh, when we, we don't make um, demands, but we do put common interests, and our common, common interest number one right off the top is workforce. And so uh, uh, really most of our Legislative communication in, in this is about workforce, you know, issues and and uh, not just teachers, but bus drivers, instructional assistants, food service, uh, mechanics, our uh, maintenance folks, you know, our custodians. Um, those shortages uh, are real and, uh, and and have an impact on the educational setting. Um, regulatory relief is a big one, and um, you know that there are 450. There's more than 450 mandates in Title 20, which is Indiana Code's primary education law, and, uh, and, then, and then also an administrative code. Um, none of those mandates have an expiration date uh, or, any, or any mechanism for them to be review, reviewed to see if whatever the original intention of that mandate was, if it's fulfilling that mandate. Um, and we were able to isolate, even um, Mr. McMichael's group went through and looked at our reporting that we do at the state level, that we, we submit the same information over and over and over again redundantly. And so a lot of that uh, regulatory relief is about how can we make it more efficient for us to get information to the IDOE and to the state um, so that we're not just you know filling in the same numbers and the same pieces over and over and over again. And, and one has the question, is that data even being looked at and why? So uh, that's, those, that's when we talk about regulatory relief, it's, it's a lot of fingers to that, but really it's more about, let's take and look at these, uh, these mandates and decide, is some, this something that needs to sunset? Is this something that needs to be eliminated? Or is this something that needs to be reviewed every three years? Uh, but let's not just put mandates in place and then say that's gonna go on forever. Uh, and and not not ever be reviewed. So, uh, so that's what the regulatory re, uh, relief piece is. Uh, the third one's a little tougher, and uh, it's probably uh, a, a topic that most people aren't aware of. But we have students that are very dysregulated. A lot of times, it's in our special services um, um, programs where the kids are very dysregulated. Uh, sometimes have uh, violent, aggressive tendencies, and uh, we really have a, a lack of of choices uh, for kids to be in an appropriate environment where those needs can be addressed. And, uh, and it puts teachers in a very difficult position and staff members when they have a dysregulated kid who's really hard to control and, uh, and they have to make decisions on, on you know, how to deal with that. So uh, there are some pieces uh, you know, of that, of students, and there's, it's not, uh, a huge number, but it is, I would say it's a growing number of students that, that need that kind of help. And, uh, and it's hard to find um, 
services and support for those kinds of those kids with those uh, disabilities and those issues. And uh, and this is something we, we feel like uh, is important to bring to the the legislators' um, attention so that um, a plan can be made. And uh, and then finally, student safety. Uh, we're fortunate here in, in Carmel that we have got several layers of student safety. That's not true across the state. And uh, a lot of superintendents, um, the current safety grant is a matching grant. And uh, some districts don't have the finances to be able to do the match. And so they miss out on the, you know, on, on that financing uh, in order to hire school resource officers or some of the other measures that we take. Uh, we're fortunate here that our community passed the safety referendum. And uh, this is yours, as Mr. McMichael noted earlier, it's the first year that we've had a school resource officer in every school uh, in the district. And I can't tell you uh, how much of a dream come true that is because um, for years and years, school safety has fallen on assistant principal and principal's um, responsibilities, but it's always been a percentage because there's a lot of jobs when you're a principal and an assistant principal. Uh, and we are so uh, blessed and fortunate that now we have one person in every one of our schools, at least one person, that their entire focus is on keeping the school, you know, keeping our kids and our staff and keeping this, the physical building of the school safe. And, uh, and I know we always kind of tend to think of active shooter, but it can be, a, it can be a, you know, a physical trip hazard. It can be doors that don't close completely. It could be... There's just a number of things that uh, uh, that our, our SROs do, and then there's uh, we always talk about school safety training as K Life, and uh, and they're able to put together programming. I'm looking at the two guys in the back because they're doing that job right now, and uh, they uh, they just do an outstanding job and making connections with our kids and, and making that a positive thing. So uh, so school safety is always going to be on the list and. and You'll never see me not have school safety on the list. And really, our state is very, um, very focused on, on school safety at this point in time also. So uh, yeah, and that's our plan. And uh, what the public may want to know what we do is we uh, will share this, this letter uh, with our, our representatives uh, that uh, represent Carmel Clay Schools area. And then uh, also, um, you know, we'll, we'll share it with other, you know, House Ways and Means, and we'll share it with the speakers, and we'll share it with the Education Committee, and uh, a lot of uh, relationships that we've built over the years in legislature. So uh, when the session goes through, uh, it's always nice when we get a call, and they say, hey, I, this is on the floor. What do you, what do you think? How's this going to play out at the school level? Uh, because just by asking us that question means that we're now included, and, uh, and that's really important. So uh, appreciate your leadership on this, Layla, and uh, you've been doing this for several years, and uh, you, know, you kind of broke me in, you know, the first year. So uh, uh, appreciate your your you're, you're going to get a lot of this, I guess, from now until the end of December. But uh, your yeah, yeah, well, your contribution's been fantastic. So thank you very much. I also wanted to share, Katie, well, and the team, once we approve this. The new legislative letter will be posted on our website under the board legislative priorities. And then once reorganization is complete and new, uh, new members are assigned to the various Ways and Means Committee and ed Education Committee, we will have that updated as well on the website. So our community has that as a resource where they, everyone is listed and they can reach out to individuals directly. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the 2023 legislative letter? So moved. Second? Second. Any board questions or comments? I'd just like to thank you. I have sat in on the meeting as the new legislative liaison, and I think you are so uniquely suited to either lead this up or to certainly participate with your depth of experience and expertise. And one would like to presume that inadvertently many times um, legislators only hear from a, uh, are hearing from the constituents in a vacuum and sometimes their policies inadvertently punitively affect the people who are in the trenches working with our students and our marginalized communities. And so it's so very important that people who actually understand the ramifications of these uh, 
initiatives are there educating and explaining, especially in light of the uh, challenges we have with staffing in the schools. And it is, as you pointed out, a very large turn that has occurred over, I'm not sure how long, where we have turned against um, the teachers and people who have devoted their life and their skill set to educating our children. So I think this is a very good effort, and the tone that it's presented, I think, makes it more um, uh, palatable, thank you, for the people that are receiving it. And so that's very important, too. So thank you very much on all of our community's behalf. Thank you. Um, again, thank you. Um, this letter, um, if it is approved, will be posted on our website, shared with um, our legislators. And I also know that you have those meetings. I'm so appreciative of the time that you take to meet with our legislators. Um, and Layla, thank you so much for your time over the years. Um, Jenny, thank you for the time that you will be giving <laughs> upcoming. And then I also wanted um, just to say how appreciative I am because there's been times where you've been asked to testify and brought down, you've, you've traveled down to the state house for certain bills and everything. So thank you for that. That, you know, is a great representation of Carmel Clay Schools. All right, I will, um, all those in favor of approving the 2023 legislative letter, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries four to zero. We will now move on to discussion. Um, are these things that we would like to take all at once? Do I have a motion to do 6.1 through 6.4 discussion? So moved. Second. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 We will now turn it over to Dr. Dudley. Thank you. So this evening, I do bring um, quite a few policies for discussion. Um, our policy committee was busy. I um, brought the first half of the policies a couple um, meetings ago for discussion and approval. And this is the second half. And so these are policies from Section 140 on membership, 150 on organization, 160 on meetings, and 170 on duties. And there's quite a few policies. However, um, there are no substantive changes as far as the meaning to the policies. It was more we just looked at it, um, cleaned it up, um, did some tweaking as far as um, the wording and um, some punctuation, but there was no substantive changes as far as the meaning to the policy. So I feel comfortable in bringing these as um, a whole to you. Thank you. Board questions? Um, I just want to take a moment and thank the policy um, committee for working with you. Um, we had just gone through reviewing every single policy that we had, and then because we um, love to have the next challenge, we started writing our bylaws. So um, I think it's an incredible um, achievement for our board to not only have had a complete review of all of our policies again, but to go through all of our bylaws again, and then we can start on policies again. <laughs> So I think that is really great to take the opportunity and to know that, you know, that the changes that were made were really just um, things such as saying, being consistent with um, formatting and things like that. So thank you. Any other board questions or comments? All right. Thank so you. I'll, I'll bring these back at our next meeting for yep. um, recommendation for approval. Thank you. We will now move again to Dr. Dudley for our student data report. Yes, thank you. So this evening, our student data report is um, talking about how we support our students um, with reading difficulties. And I have uh, Mrs. Ann Arroyo, um, one of our directors of um, learning, to share with us information on um, some data that we're required to um, submit to the state and collect, and how we support our students that do have those reading um, difficulties. Thank you. So we're going to start tonight by talking just briefly about what the definition of dyslexia actually is. Um, many people um, have misconceptions or a narrow definition of dyslexia uh, that can make it hard or sometimes even scary to even mention it or when we're talking about students with learning difficulties related to reading. When we understand something more deeply, we can better address it. So this is the definition from um, Indiana. And this is taken from the International Dyslexia Association's definition. 
Um, in reading this, you might say, well, Ann, this doesn't really help me understand it. They talk about dyslexia being a specific learning disability that's neurobiological in origin. Um, they talk about it being a phonological component of a, a deficit and a phonological component. Um, and then they talk about reading comprehension, how that impacts growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. So instead of trying to unpack this kind of complex definition, I'm going to have us watch a short video um, that kind of breaks down what dyslexia actually is. Take a moment to read the following. How was that? Frustrating? Slow? What were those sentences about? They're actually a simulation of the experience of dyslexia, designed to make you decode each word. Those with dyslexia experience that laborious pace every time they read. When most people think of dyslexia, they think of seeing letters and words backwards, like seeing B as D and vice versa, or they might think people with dyslexia see saw as was. The truth is, people with dyslexia see things the same way as everyone else. Dyslexia is caused by a phonological processing problem, meaning people affected by it have trouble not with seeing language, but with manipulating it. For example, if you heard the word cat and then someone asked you, remove the C, what word would you have left? At. This can be difficult for those with dyslexia. Given a word in isolation like fantastic, students with dyslexia need to break the word into parts to read it. Fan, tas, tick. Time spent decoding makes it hard to keep up with peers and gain sufficient comprehension. Spelling words phonetically like stik for stick and frens for friends is also common. These difficulties are more widespread and varied than commonly imagined. Dyslexia affects up to one in five people. It occurs on a continuum. One person might have mild dyslexia, while the next person has a profound case of it. Dyslexia also runs in families. It's common to see one family member who has trouble spelling, while another family member has severe difficulty decoding even one-syllable words like catch. The continuum and distribution of dyslexia suggest a broader principle to bear in mind as we look at how the brains of those with dyslexia process language. Neurodiversity is the idea that because all our brains show differences in structure and function, we shouldn't be so quick to label every deviation from the norm as a pathological disorder or dismiss people living with these variations as defective. People with neurobiological variations like dyslexia, including such creative and inventive individuals as Picasso, Muhammad Ali, Whoopi Goldberg, Steven Spielberg, and Cher, clearly have every capacity to be brilliant and successful in life. So here's the special way the brains of those with dyslexia work. The brain is divided into two hemispheres. The left hemisphere is generally in charge of language and ultimately reading while the right typically handles spatial activities. fMRI studies have found that the brains of those with dyslexia rely more on the right hemisphere and frontal lobe than the brains of those without it. This means when they read a word, it takes a longer trip through their brain and can get delayed in the frontal lobe. Because of this neurobiological glitch, they read with more difficulty. But those with dyslexia can physically change their brain and improve their reading. With an intensive, multi-sensory intervention that breaks the language down and teaches the reader to decode based on syllable types and spelling rules, the brains of those with dyslexia begin using the left hemisphere more efficiently while reading, and their reading improves. The intervention works because it locates dyslexia appropriately as a functional variation in the brain, which naturally shows all sorts of variations from one person to another. Neurodiversity emphasizes this spectrum of brain function in all humans and suggests that to better understand the perspectives of those around us, we should try to not only see the world through their eyes, but understand it through their brains. Okay, so 
another way to think about dyslexia, um, this little quadrant chart kind of helps us understand what students who have dyslexia, what they struggle with. So a typical reader who um, has typical reading ability, they're going to be strong or good in their word recognition process. So they're able to read the words on the page, decode, break words down into syllables, spell words accurately. And they also have strong language comprehension. So that would be a typical average reader. A student with dyslexia, however, may still be strong in language comprehension, but will have deficits in that word recognition process. What often can happen with a student with dyslexia, somebody who we haven't caught early enough, that student with dyslexia who may be coming in with strong language comprehension, because they're unable to decode or read the words on the page, they have more limited access to complex text and complex ideas. And we talk about the Matthew effect in reading where you hear the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. A student with dyslexia or showing signs of dyslexia early on, if we don't catch them early enough, it can sometimes migrate into what we would call general reading disability, where they're both weak in word recognition as well as language comprehension. So one um, positive thing that's happened with our Indiana dys um, dyslex or legislation is that a few years back, we had Senate Enrolled Act 217, which brought Indiana dyslexia legislation to all of our schools in Indiana. And this provided us um, some backbone and some urgency to work we were already doing in the district and to make our programming even stronger for these kids who are exhibiting um, risk for dyslexia. So Indiana Code outlines the following requirements for schools that were to follow when it comes to working with students and supporting students with learning characteristics related to dyslexia which includes specific guidance on school staffing and training, how we screen students for characteristics of dyslexia, how we respond to student needs based on those assessment results, how we communicate with parents and notify parents, and then also we report information about all of this to our community and to the IDOE. Let's take a few minutes, probably the most important part of that legislation, at least from my point of view, is starting with our dyslexia screening process. So per the legislation, we are required to screen all students in grades K through two using dyslexia, a dyslexia screener. So the screener that we use is called the NWA MAP Reading Fluency. So it's a suite of assessments that comes out of um, our MAP, our NWA portal. Um, but it's a separate assessment. It's not the same as the NWA MAP assessment. This is administered individually to students. So students can take it, a whole class can take it at once. Um, and it assesses the following areas, and these are the areas we're required to assess for our dyslexia screeners. So it looks at phonological and phonemic awareness, sound symbol recognition, alphabet knowledge, decoding skills, rapid naming skills, and encoding or spelling skills. Um, with this assessment, and Indiana requires us to use an assessment that also provides a flag that would indicate a student might be at risk for dyslexia. So this is a little screenshot of a report a teacher may see where it leaves, gives you the student name, how they did in each of the categories, um, and then they have a little purple flag next to their name that would indicate that maybe there's something a teacher needs to look, to look at more closely. So it's important to note in these screeners, though, that that flag does not mean a student has dyslexia. We, as a district, do not diagnose students with dyslexia. We can identify students for being at risk or at some risk with characteristics, but only a medical doctor can actually diagnose a child with dyslexia. But this flag can give us the information we need to do a little bit, um, look a little deeper and do a little bit more digging on if there are some issues with their reading that we need to be paying attention to and providing intervention and accommodations for. Um, K2 is required for all students every year in all of these areas. If a student is in grades three all the way up through 12, is exhibiting some of these characteristics as well, and they haven't been on our radar, and a teacher or a parent or someone in the school community says, hey, I think there's something here that looks like it might be related to um, characteristics like dyslexia, then we are required to screen those students as well and then enact intervention for any student that is flagged. So we have two years worth of data. We've actually been doing a, um, the screener for K2 for four years. We used some different measures our first two years while we we're figuring things out and while the state of Indiana was also kind of figuring out their guidance on that as well. And, Tools hadn't quite been developed for us yet, but the last two years we've been using this map reading fluency, which does provide that flag for us, which is really nice for us to be able to track how kids are doing 
and then also to be able to determine if we need to do some more diagnostic work and then if they actually need intervention related to dyslexia. So we have our screener data, data from 2021. Um, it's important to note this is, these are kids who are coming out of the COVID year. Um, so when we look at kindergarten, for example, we see 16% of our students were flagged, which is somewhat high, um, higher than I'd like it to be. However, we also gave this assessment right at the beginning of kindergarten last, um, last year. So many of our kids really weren't ready quite yet to sit and do a computerized assessment of this type on their own yet. They may also not have had a lot of um, rich literacy experiences before they entered kindergarten. So one thing we learned and we decided this year is that we waited for kindergarten to give them some more time to acclimate, but also to get more time to get good instruction from their teachers. We are not completely done with kindergarten yet. We just started the window um, a few weeks back, but we have about 72% of all kindergarten uh, students have tested so far, and already we can see quite a drop in our kindergarten numbers. Um, we also tested at the semester at, of 2021, and a lot of kids, re we retested them, dropped off at the semester once they got used to school. Our first grade numbers were our highest last year. It was 17%. These were kiddos who really missed the last half of kindergarten due to COVID, um, which is a critical time in kindergarten for all of that information to synthesize and come together when it comes to learning how to read. So I'm pleased to see from first grade to this year in second grade after a year of having some good instruction with our new programming that we also started in 2021, we saw a pretty decent drop. Um, again, that was our first year with a new program plus um, trying to learn phonics with masks on, which is a whole other type of challenge of its own there. So we've made a lot of growth. We still have some work to do there, but we have some really great programming in place to help us with that. So once a student is flagged, um, we go through a process where we let the parents know that a student has received a flag, what that means, and then we um, get permission to do a diagnostic assessment. And that diagnostic assessment really helps us be able to look at, alongside all the other classroom data that we have um, from the teacher, from our foundation's unit tests, from our end, other NWA testing, if there is a profile here that is consistent with a student showing risk factors for dyslexia or is somebody who just needs extra support in reading. So once we have determined that a student really needs that work and that support, um, we really work to um, make that intervention tailored to their specific needs. What we also make sure that we do is that the intervention is really following what the research says about what kids with dyslexia need when it comes to instruction. And our um, legislation from the state also says this is what instruction should look like, and that is that it's explicit, direct, systematic, sequential, and cumulative, and that it's multi-sensory, so using two or more um, sensory pathways when you're teaching. So most of our kids are getting that direct instruction through their tier one classroom. So when we look at our core instruction, that's really where all the good stuff happens, is right in our classrooms with all kids every day. And our foundation's programming that we use is explicit, systematic, and multi-sensory. So we cover and hit quite a few kids right away with our tier one programming. Um, for kids who need some more exposures, they need more time, they need more intensity, then we start looking at um, bringing in other programs or other approaches to work with those students that helps them with their reading, but again, is still explicit, systematic, and multi-sensory. So some of the things that you might see in our classroom um, foundations, our core program has a tier one intervention that our classroom teachers can use right within the classroom. For kids who need more, we use something that is called either a letters structured literacy lesson plan. Um, we also, you'll hear OG or Orton Gillingham being used with students. That's another approach that is explicit, systematic, and multi-sensory. We're also trialing and bringing on Just Words, which is another program that's really for older students that brings this approach um, for kids who maybe missed it in K-1-2, they just didn't catch it um, quickly enough. Um, and then we also use um, phonological awareness, one-minute drills, and we bring in a lot of decodable text. I think you saw a lot of those in our um, CEF grants, a lot of teachers getting more de decodable text for their kiddos. So um, really the most important work, as I kind of shared earlier, um, that happens really is in that Tier 1 classroom. And what we know from... Um, the research on the science of reading is that all kids, pretty much all kids, about 95% of kids, 
benefit from that structured literacy approach, that explicit multi-sensory direct instruction in phonics school. And um, this ladder of reading really speaks to that, and that only about 5% of kids can learn to read, and it's seemingly effortless for them. Um, and that's not necessarily your high ability students either. Many kids who are high ability can also be dyslexic as well. So there's um, the majority of our kids really do benefit from that approach. And if you are a student who has dyslexia or is showing characteristics of dyslexia, and you're in that bottom 10 to 15%, it is critical for you to have that structured literacy approach to learning how to read. So when we think about our core programming, we have our foundations programming, which all kids receive K through three, and that is 30 minutes a day. Um, and that even goes into our high ability classroom where it's teaching for that direct approach for learning how to do ph learning phonics and uh, spelling. And then we also have Hegarty, which is a phonemic awareness program. Um, it's a really quick program we use in K1 just to continue to de develop the phonological awareness skills in those kiddos. And I'm gonna show a quick video of what foundations looks like. This is from one of our um, news reports that Mrs. Bauer gave to us in our website last year. So look at what that looks like. Wrapping up here this evening, one of the most important things that we like to remind teachers of when we're doing all of this work, whether it's with our tier one programming with foundations, understanding what we call the science of reading, um, or within our intervention programming, programming is that everybody's looking for a perfect program for teaching kids how to read. There's no one perfect program that's going to do that, but the thing that makes the biggest, that makes the biggest difference and is the greatest factor um, is our teachers. And this is from Dr. Louisa Motes, who's on the Science of Reading Guru. Uh, she says that teachers are the most important factor in student success. Informed teachers are our best insurance against reading failure. While programs are helpful tools, programs don't teach, teachers do. We have tons of teachers who are engaged every day in voluntary PD. Um, throughout our district, we have cohorts of teachers for the last couple of years going through a really intensive experience called Letters. Um, and that is K through 12. We have teachers participating in that. We just started a science of reading cohort for our re, uh, resource and our intervention teachers, K through 12. We're really working on helping them understand the brain science behind how kids learn to read, particularly those um, who might fall into a category of dyslexia or needing um, having an IEP. We also are doing um, ongoing training all the time with our coaches, either on right in within our schools with our school-based coaches and we have um, two district level coaches who support this work, not just in our elementary, but have been doing more and more work even into the um, upper grades and into high school. So we have a lot of really great things happening with supporting our students in their reading. Um, we're really excited to see the fruits of this labor continue to grow um, because we really think this is gonna give us um, the recipe for success as we continue to get better and better each year. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you so very much. Questions from the board? Layla? I have a few questions. Sure. Um, so if in the general population, 20% have dyslexia. Um, so I'd have to say it's great to see on our baseline um, the statistics were far less than 20%. Mm -hmm. um, 
what happens in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade? A, what kind of support do we have for those students? And are we tracking how those students are doing throughout um, as they matriculate? Great question. Um, we really have, we, we really focus a lot of energy in K1, 2, 3, but K1, 2 in particular. We know the research says if a student has dyslexia or is just struggling with um, reading in a way that is similar to dyslexia, we can catch them because we know that the brain, the brain regardless, everybody learns to read the same way. And we know that if we teach with this approach, some kids may need longer, but we can get them. And so that 20% or that one in five, um, we really think it's probably less if you can do the right things early on and intervene early. You can really cut that number down quite a bit. Even if a student might still have dyslexia, we can still get them to the place where they need to be to be a proficient reader. For kids in grades three, four, five, and up, it becomes more challenging. Um, we have in our elementary, every elementary has a reading interventionist. So our reading interventionists are trained in how to support those students. So we still provide, even though the state requires screening K through two, we continue to screen and identify kids um, needing reading support and providing interventions. Um, typically that looks like by the time we get to that level, a more intensive Orton-Gillingham approach or a letters approach or using um, a new program we're using is called Just Words, which is actually from, it's an arm of foundation, so it's for upper grades. Um, 6 through 12, it's trickier. Um, it's trickier to find the right time because just because a student has dyslexia may not mean they need to be um, in with a special educator even. We have students that are dyslexic who don't have an IEP um, because they may, but that doesn't mean they don't need still need support in learning how to read. So we are working <clears throat> right now with our secondary on how to find that space and that time for those students to give them that type of instruction they need that's not just accommodations, that continues to work on teaching them how to decode and read and become fluent readers. So that part is trickier at secondary, we're still navigating that. We have pockets where we're trying things out and trying to find the space and the time and also the expertise because many of our secondary people uh, don't have this background. Quite frankly, many of our elementary teachers in school don't learn much of what we're learning now. Um, we're getting a lot of people caught up on the science of reading and how to teach phonics and phonological awareness. So that's an area we're still growing in. Um, in terms of tracking, we're also working on developing, we're working with a tech team right now in developing systems within PowerSchool um, and Pinnacle to be able to better track those students because we do have a challenge when the kids go from fifth to six and they don't come in with an IEP but we've been servicing them for reading support and we know they could still benefit from that type of support. How do we get that information? How do we help support them through those transitions as well? Excellent, thank you. Second question, um, I don't know this answer, so I will be asking, does dyslexia affect your ability to, if you, when it comes to numbers, in numerical values, does it affect that as well, or is it just words and letters, and how does that translate to mathematics? Um, that's a great question. I am not so much an expert in that area, but what we do know, we see it often, is that students, um, particularly, we'll start to see it in upper grades more than in our primary grades. Um, for kids that, I can think of a handful of kids already we've talked about this year, that really the challenges start to suddenly come in math. They were having trouble um, tracking multi-steps and having um, longer problems and kind of keeping track of all the, the pieces. And then as we started peeling back the layers, we were finding, well, we're also struggling still with some reading things. And then we were finding that there were some characteristics of dyslexia there. So often we start to see those pieces overlap. There's also something called dyscalculia, um, which is similar but not the same as dyslexia, but um, I think can it um, manifests in a similar way within the math realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question, this is very interesting to me as we're dealing with this in our own household. Um, you mentioned that a child could be flagged and then the family is asked for permission to test the child. How often in your 
experience, do, does a parent, either one of the parents or both of the parents, decide that they do not want to allow their child to be tested um, uh, to get the help they need? Very often. We have a handful I can think of this year that just did not want that, and mm -hmm. that is they have the right to turn down that type of diagnostic. We'll still continue to work with them to find a way to support their child in a way that works for them, but also helps continue, helps the child continue to learn and grow. But most families, um, I would say one of the things they got a little nervous this year because we actually did use the word we referenced, the legislation, and that this was notifying that your child might be at risk or at some risk for characteristics of dyslexia. And so we used that language this year. Um, we made kind of a concerted effort to call it what it was um, and use the language. There's kind of a movement in the dyslexia community to, to say what it is. Um, a lot of times, myself included, many years past, we wouldn't use that word to say, well, we can't, we can't diagnose, so we don't even want to call it what it is. But then we weren't able to address it either. Mm -hmm. um, so we did have some families who I think were worried about what that meant to be testing for that. Um, but then once our either assistant principal or a classroom teacher reached out to the family, explained what it is, explained what we would do, what that assessment looked like, and how then their child might be helped if they needed it, most parents say, oh, yeah, sure, great. That sounds great. But the school does have limited uh, ability to push that forward and help the child to and, and address the, their learning needs if that is not allowed to. Correct. The um, legislation is pretty clear, and I would say the DOE in the last year, their guidance document has been very specific about receiving consent from mm -hmm. families mm -hmm. um, and and following a certain process when we have students who are identified. So we've been very um, careful and cognizant about making sure that everybody's on board and that everybody's on the same page as we move yeah. forward to support and, students. And then I know from this experience that it is not a diagnosis. It's just um, trying to teach tools. Is it helpful to have a diagnosis so that one may be able to receive more specific help? Or is it um, sufficient to just recognize that there's an issue and there's plenty of tools in the arsenal to help? I would say the support we give isn't any different. So for some families, having that diagnostic diagnosis is a relief, and it helps them say, okay, um, we, know what this, we know what this dragon is. We can slay this. We can do this. Um, but it's not necessary. Okay. I mean, once we, once we say there are areas here that we're noticing within their phonological processing or their consistent struggling to orthographically map words through um, and be able to identify words phonetically, we can start attacking it in the same way we would as if a student who has has been diagnosed with dyslexia. Probably as kids age up, it sometimes can be helpful because if you're going to then get into a situation where you have an IEP and it's very specifically written that way, we can write it in the IEP whether a doctor diagnose, di um, diagnose, diagnose, too many diagnoses, <laughs> diagnoses it. Um, we can also say in an IEP that a student is as an SLD, um, with characteristics of dyslexia. So either way, we can it can be listed there so that schools are alerted to that within an IEP and then we can provide the appropriate instruction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much for your time and it was definitely something we learned quite a bit. So thank, thank you. you. We will now move on to our monthly financial update. Mr. McMichael. It's over uh, 4.5 million, and in in uh, 21, uh, as a comparison, uh, we were at um, one point, almost 1.7 million. So most of that difference is because we have uh, some, about 2.3 million in cash balance in our rainy day fund. So when you factor that in, uh, we're tracking pretty closely to last year, a little bit ahead, but we need to be a little ahead because our budgets are bigger, and so we look at it as a percentage. So the dollar amount needs to grow over time. In our operating fun, operating, operations fund, um, we 
are a negative uh, $2.9 million. Um, as compared to last year, uh, it was less than that at about one point, almost 1.6. Uh, as I've, uh, I've said before, this fund is not as comparable uh, because of the nature of the fund of, of a number of things that are non-personnel, everything from buses to uh, various maintenance items. Um, and so, but we still, we can still show the comparison um, um, but until we get to the end of the year, uh, either the county year or the fiscal year. Uh, that's, a, that's a better time to, to kind of compare. And then as I noted, our rainy day fund, we have just over $2.3 million. Um, as you may recall, we plan to uh, increase this balance over time um, so that um, it increases our overall cash balance between, the, between this fund and the education fund and the, and the um, operations fund. That, um, one, it, it helps our uh, financial stability. Uh, for future unknown uh, circumstances, and, and it also uh, um, helps us a bit with our bond um, ratings with um, Standard and Poor's when we sell bonds. They would like to see us have a little more cash balance than we typically have had, and so we, we plan to grow that about 4 or 5% from where it's at. So with that, I respond to questions if you have any. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Not this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now move on to our superintendent's report. Actually, board member reports. Anything from the board? Yeah. Well, before I start, I wanted to also point out that uh, uh, Dr. Arroyo over there uh, is also the parent of a state and national Greyhound marching band student. So, so <laughs> not only. <laughs> Not only is she brilliant, she has kids that can flat out perform. So, uh, no, uh, I really enjoyed that presentation because um, uh, one of the things that uh, I think that uh, where education is going is what I would call early intervention. And uh, that whole science of reading where these screeners are happening uh, enables us to intervene quicker and earlier. And then uh, that, that foundation or foundation uh, is... Uh, uh, really makes a, a difference, and uh, and it's kind of a, one of our goals in our strategic plan is to develop instruments where we can get a, a quick, you know, a quick identification that doesn't say you have this problem, but says you may have something going on. Let's look deeper and get the intervention or get the support that's needed in order to be successful. And uh, that's just a great example. So I really appreciate your report tonight. It was great. Um, you may notice I'm, I am uh, representing the Butler Bulldogs today. And uh, if you look over to your right over there, you'll see an Indiana Hoosier. And if you look over to your left over there uh, behind that, you'll see a, a boiler up there and a boiler up there. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and another boiler. So I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm from Illinois, so I don't really have a dog in that fight. But... Um, but we sure had it in our office today. I mean, geez. But uh, I wanted you to know that um, we're doing this. Uh, today was college day. Uh, and so um, we're promoting uh, here at the ESC, we're doing a food drive uh, for some of our families that may need some uh, extra support there. So, uh, um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I've also got my Butler Bulldog socks on, but I won't show you those. But, um, but we did uh, make it through the day. And uh, I have a picture of the IU and, and Purdue um, folks from my office uh, being very cordial and friendly. So uh, it can be done. Um, I want to, st uh, secondly, um, acknowledge Angelica Becker from Carmel High School uh, was presented the National Florence Steiner Award for Leadership for Contributions to World Language Education. And uh, uh, Angelica's just, uh, she's been uh, recognized several different times in, uh, in the world languages um, profession. And uh, this is a big one, uh, so that's a national award, and uh, just congratulations to her. Uh, those of you that know uh, um, her husband, Ted, worked here at the ESC for, uh, for several years, and a great guy, and, uh, and uh, what a great family. But congratulations to, to Mrs. Becker from Carmel High School. Um, also, along great news, um, Creekside Middle School, um, leadership team there, uh, new principal, Stephen Pellich, was the District 7 Principal of the Year. And uh, 
his district that he was in before we hired him this summer was seven, and he was down in Washington Township and was chosen by that the principals in that district for as principal of the year. I believe that's his second year in a row maybe he's chosen that way. And then at the same time, uh, assistant principal Jessica Tubbs was chosen as the assistant principal of the year for, for District 5. So, uh, so Creekside's got some, uh, some celebrating to do there. And uh, so congratulations to them. And then uh, I, I know I'm getting to be like a broken record, but did you see the Carmel Marching Greyhounds at Macy's Parade on TV? And, uh, and uh, it was so cool uh, because did you hear what they called them? They called them the nation's premier band and uh, introduced them to Carmel Marching. And, uh, you know, and I was, they were so good. I mean, they, they threw the rifles and they catch them, caught them in exactly the same sec, millisecond. And it was, the music was fantastic. So uh, anyhow, uh, premier marching band in the nation, Carmel, Carmel Greyhounds. Uh, my bell ringer is uh, that, you know, November is about done. I think Wednesday is the, the last day, and No Shave November is uh, coming to a close. And uh, uh, more than a decade ago, I started doing the No Shave November to bring attention to, at that time, men's mental health, because men weren't talking about mental health at all. And uh, there was actually a, a lot of dangerous data uh, following that. Uh, but I'm happy to report that since then, the stigma, I believe, is, is diminishing. Uh, the, as, as associated. It's not dead, but it, I think it's, it's diminishing. And, uh, and actually, uh, kind of made a, a, a pivot to, to, to make No Shave November just about mental health uh, for everybody and, uh, and to pay attention to that. And so um, it's okay to not be okay. Um, and we say it, but we want our staff and our students and families to know it. And uh, so if you're a member, a staff member, we have help and support uh, through our wellness center. Uh, if your student is in need of help, do not hesitate to reach out to your student's teacher, principal, school counselor, school social worker, because we have therapy services available uh, for all of our students at every school in the district through St. Vincent Ascension. So uh, it's, it's a, it's so, so parents have a choice to, to, to go to that therapist, just like you have a choice to go to any therapist. Uh, you know, in the city, but it does reduce the barriers of having to leave work, go pick up your kid, take them away. The, the student can uh, get seen, I'd say, quicker, more often, and more regular um, using that kind of a, uh, that program. And then the whole vision of that program is to, to reduce barriers to mental health supports like that. Um, and then, um, uh, we also have what the Stop It app. So if you have concerns about a friend or a staff member and but you don't feel comfortable and can go in public with that, we have the Stop It app where you can do a, a, a uh, anonymous message and uh, bring it to our attention so we can intervene with somebody that you think may be struggling out there. Uh, most importantly, if you're struggling or if you're suffering in silence, all right, just reach out. Um, we all need help at different times in our lives, and there is help and there is hope. And so uh, as we draw to a close with um, No Shave November, um, uh, the scruff was worth it. And, uh, and, but we do want to not lose the message that uh, um, we all need help sometimes. So don't, don't hesitate to reach out because we have help available. And that was my bell ringer. So with that, I'll uh, close out my report. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as we close out this meeting, I would just like to say um, a message of gratitude, how thankful um, I am for um, the board, for all the time that you give, our administration, um, our teachers, staff. Thank you for attending our meetings and supporting our district. Um, I will now take a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, signify. Aye. Aye. Meeting closed.